Welcome to i March webinar on implementing a unified incident response structure. I am Linda Nelson. I am the founder and president of the International Consortium for Organizational Resilience, and I will be your speaker today. We're going to start by looking at the purpose, applicability, and focus of incident response and really the importance of a unified response. We're then going to look at some of the principles of incident response and, and factors to consider in planning your response capability. Also looking at what does a unified incident response structure look like and how can we work together to manage the response and then close with just a little bit about what should be in your incident, incident response plans and procedures. Um, this recording will be on the i webinar page in a couple of days. If you have questions, um, use the questions button. I will try to um, answer them either as I go along through the different polls perhaps, or at the conclusion of the webinar. And you need to attend 35 minutes to get your certificate of attendance. So let's start off with our first poll, and the question is, which describe which of the following best describes your role in an incident or in managing an incident? So is it your primary role? Is it not your primary role, but you are a part of a planning process? Or it is not your current role, but it's of interest to you in the future? I believe it says my screen is paused, so I apologize. Let me um, see if I can. This is very strange. I'm trying to unpause it. Let me, uh, I don't think I can do anything until we're done with the poll. So let me finish the poll and then I will go back to sharing my screen. Looks like just about everyone has voted. So in case the results aren't showing, it says that 34% of you, it's your primary role. That's great. And 58%, it's not your primary role, but you're a part of the planning team. And only 8% don't have it as anything that they're doing right now, but um, have an interest. So welcome. All right. So I hope now that you're seeing my screen, and I really do apologize for that. As I was transitioning from the pre to the to the current, I got lost. All right, um, let's go ahead and, and really start with this definition. The definition is important because people use all different words to mean all different things. And oftentimes they're very um, organization specific. So I wanna start by defining what is an incident for your organization. We're going to look at how ISO defines incident and, and, several, and several of their different standards. So the first one is with business continuity. They're calling it a situation that could be or could lead to a disruption, a loss, um, an emergency, or a crisis. So here they're using the word situation. When we get to um, supply chain security in the 28 100 series or 28,000 series, it call, they're calling it an event that has been assessed as having an actual or potentially adverse effect. So here they're not using that long list of disruption laws, so they're just saying it could do something negative, potentially or for real. When you move to IT security, here they're being a little more specific and they're calling it an occurrence. So we started with the situation, we've moved to event, now we're with an occurrence that actually, or potentially, so the same idea that might be or could be, jeopardizes, and now we're specifically looking at the confidentiality, the integrity, or the availability of an IT system. And then when we look at 27001 on information security, they have a couple, they actually have two definitions in their one. So that they define a security incident as an unwanted event, that could endanger the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of information, whereas an event versus an unwanted event is any kind of technical occurrence or activity that could indicate a possible breach of data. 
So you can see there's some variability here, but there is a commonality, meaning they're using that word incident to describe things that could hurt your organization and hurt your organization in some manner. And so we'll, we'll talk about the different types of incidents as well. But the other terms that are used are terms like incident response. And so it, and when you look at um, both NIST and which is the national, it's, it's the national thing here in the US, it's 1800-61, we're gonna talk about that a little bit, but they talk about incident handling. So incident handling and incident response are the same things. So these are actions taken in order to stop the causes of an imminent hazard, now they've used the word hazard, and or to mitigate the consequences of potentially destabilizing events or disruptions and to recover to a normal situation. So they've thrown a lot of different terms in here, but essentially it's the response to an incident and you're trying to manage that incident. And then when you look at incident management itself, it's that process for responding to unplanned events and the recovery to that normal operational state. So the incident response is kind of the, if you wanna call it the verb, and the, where incident management becomes more of a noun, it's the process. And then you have an incident management system, which is where you have really defined those roles and responsibilities of personnel and the operating procedures that you're gonna use for the management of incidents. So these three are very much related to each other. It's just moving kind of from one to the other and, and in the formality of that. So ISO 22320 is a standard in, um, emergency management where they use a lot of the same um, applicability to incident management or incident response that we're talking about here. So when you're looking at the principles of how this should happen, they talk about unity of command and this idea that every person at any point of time reports to only one supervisor. So during any sort of an incident response, there should be very, it should be very clear as to who's in charge and who reports to whom. Obviously we need um, teams working together and if you're working this from, a, if it's some sort of an incident that requires multiple organizations, that they also would need to work together. We do know that incident response is based on risk management and so we really need to remember that, that this is, should be part of our whole risk management system, which is part of what we're gonna be talking about today in great detail. Of course, it requires you to be prepared. Um, and in this case, they use that all hazards approach because it's coming more from an emergency management kind of public sector side of things or government. And you need to share information and different perspectives. So we'll talk about incident reporting as well today too. One of the things that everybody wants to be very clear on is that your people come first. And so just making sure that everybody is safe, whether it's the responders and or those impacted, they both require um, safety to be the first priority. That your incident response needs to be flexible because we know that whatever you've planned for probably isn't exactly what's happening. So you need to ha take those plans and procedures and be able to adapt them and scale them based on what's actually happened. We also need to take into account both human and cultural factors that each of us is different and a response in even you know one country might look different than a response in another country. So if you're a global organization, um, that might look very different, depending, not hugely different, but there might be things that, that have to be taken into account. And of course, every principle for any sort of standard always talks about continuous improvement and that we always are trying to enhance your organizational performance. Well, so what really, why are we talking about this? Well. Obviously it's important, but the other piece of this is that there have been changing demographics. Really in the past, and I think potentially still in currently, incidents or emergencies or disasters, whatever words you want to use, have happened at a location. So it, you know, it's at a physical address, that things are happening to a building and to a place. Um, so whether you're looking at that incident response from the lens of an emergency responder and looking at your community or whether you're looking at this from the government sector or whether you're looking at this from um, an, a business organization. Oftentimes you're looking at this from an actual physical location. 
This is especially the case, for example, in the US, the government, everything's planned around a facility. And so they've had to really start taking a look at that as well. Because what we're seeing is that incidents are becoming more and more multi-organizational and multinational. And one of the things, if you can be appreciative of anything with the pandemic, it is that we've just raised our awareness of how interconnected we are um, around the world. And that it's very hard to, to put a kind of a closure or, or a boundary on where things happen. And a lot of this is due to increased urbanization, We've definitely seen um, how critical infrastructure and interdependencies are um, very dependent on each other. And even if you just look at you know, things like the supply chain and, and the environment, doesn't matter um, if there is a border between the US and Canada or between the US and Mexico, for example. Um, you know, the environment is the environment and it doesn't make any difference where a country or a state or a province begins or ends. And we've definitely seen with our supply chains that movement of people and goods having been impacted um, by challenges in, in one country versus another country and how that impacts everybody in the world. And so all of these things together has really increased the potential for incidents to transcend geographic and political boundaries. So we really need to start thinking about what are these changing demographics mean? I also wanted to just be very clear that incident response has got applicability across every way that you manage risk in your organization, whether it's through life safety, whether it's through information or cybersecurity or technology piece, whether it's in your supply chain, whether it's part of business continuity, um, whether it's natural disasters, and maybe that might be the only thing you're planning for, or even including reputational types of incidents. And so what we're, our challenge here today is to build an incident response capability that can be applied to any function. So when I'm using the word function today, I'm really looking at things, uh, different ways that you manage risk that you would put um, activities around. So that's what we're calling this any function. Obviously we're talking about managing risk, so we didn't put um, risk management up here because these are all different ways to manage risk. But we need to do this across multiple functions within the organization, and we need them to operate as one system. And what we've so often done is built siloed response systems. And therefore, when we have a larger type of incident, I'm just gonna keep using that word incident, that um, we are all operating separately and the collaboration is very difficult and we sometimes find ourselves at cross purposes. Collaboration is a really, big behavior and the manage of, management of incidents demands collaboration. You can't do that if you're not making decisions together based on agreed incident management objectives, those that are prepared ahead of time and those that need to be prepared at the time of the incident. And so we really need to be able to manage a situation whenever those circumstances change and be able to modify decisions when necessary. And this requires that behavior of collaboration and if we're all working in our own little areas, and I've heard the word a lot of times people have said, no, I'm just staying in my lane, Linda. I'm not going to um, move outside of my lane. It's not a safe place to be. I'm just staying where I've been told to do. And you know, that's really fine if something's very simple and, it's, and what's happening is in your lane. But if, it's, if it goes outside of your lane, what do you do unless you have those relationships established where you can collaborate? So within, um, i -Course has an organizational resilience model and we have a preparedness and managing risk aspect to that. And so when you're looking at how can we put together resilient strategies to improve our preparedness and managing risk capability, one of those is to put together the strategy to implement a systems approach. And so putting together a coordinated approach to increase preparedness and managing risk that ensures the alignment of your systems and the elimination of your silos that may create barriers amongst those functions. And so a strategic objective that you might put in place is that you want to make sure that there's coordination and alignment of your systems. So you're going to ensure that you have the capability to design and develop systems to increase preparedness and managing risk. You might also say that you want to create a unified incident response structure. 
And you're going to do that to increase your efficiencies, to determine common and incident objectives, and to achieve what's called, oftentimes called joint direction. At a minimum, we need to coordinate and align our systems within these three pillars. And I get, it's very frustrating to hear, and it's, it makes me, not just frustrating, but it's sort of disheartening maybe is the better word, to see that within our operations, and we're just putting these into a pillar just to be able to talk about them, but incident response, business continuity, crisis management, and supply chain management are often separate. And, and people within those functions and teams within those individual four functions aren't talking to each other. So if you're looking for a place to start and you're in one and you and you work in one of those functions, the very first thing you need to be doing is trying to get your operations into one system. If you work in the technology side of the business, whether it's your critical environments, data centers, you know, I, I'm never, I, I've said this before, I'm trying to avoid using the word disaster recovery and instead talk about, you know, your service continuity, your information communication technology continuity within your data storage and your availability systems and your information and cybersecurity systems. At a minimum, those technology systems need to be working together. And then your other kind of what we call management systems you know, how you manage your assets, your facilities, all of the things in your facilities, your quality systems, your financial systems, and your talent management systems should also be working together. Ideally, all three of these should be working together to have a resilience capability. It is a fundamental piece of building your resilience and becoming a more resilient organization is to begin thinking about being work operating as a system and getting your different functions to work together across the organization. And these are the ones that we've posted here are kind of the big buckets. You might have smaller buckets for these, but just to give you an idea of what it is that we're talking about when we're talking about systems-based thinking. One of the things that can be very frustrating is that, um, especially in information and cybersecurity, it's very difficult um, and you often see companies failing. Number one, no matter for what kind of, no matter what function you're in, inadequate resources, it, it seems like we never have enough of the team to actually get the work done. So sometimes we're missing that M in team. And what we often see in information and cybersecurity is just those alert overloads. Like there's just, how do you even know how to respond and, and just to keep up with them and identifying which ones we need to respond to. And as we've seen, um, a lot in 2023 as it continues from 2022 is this loss of knowledge and people walking out the door. And so all of a sudden the people that have that knowledge have left. And, and finally, sometimes this really difficulty in measuring success is how do we even know how to measure success because incidents are dynamic and they're different from each other. And so it's sometimes hard to sell what a great job we're doing because we can't really replicate what we've done in, in the past and to be able to show growth from one incident to another, we need to come up with ways to measure those to show that as well. So I'm gonna start with just a very simple um, internal escalation protocol that I've borrowed from melissaagnes.com for crisis management, but just looking at how we could modify that. So you've got some sort of an incident that you've detected and somebody needs to be notified. And so you, you need to, in your organization, have identified who do you notify. <coughs> Excuse me. So I mentioned, you know, you're going to notify the appropriate team or the appropriate person, but who is that? And at that point, whoever gets notified, somebody needs to do an analysis of what it is that's been detected. And so you might ask the question, does the incident potentially exceed our risk appetite? And this is why risk appetite is so important to have documented. So you have an understanding of what you're accepting and what you're not, and when you need to take action and, and when you don't, or when you just need to um, observe and see what's going on. The other thing that you see a lot in information and cybersecurity is having incident scenarios, which I also think are really helpful to help decide, okay, does this meet one of the things that we've planned for? And one of the things that we've decided is something that we need to respond to. And we'll talk a little bit more about both of those. But if it doesn't meet those things, then, all right, it's just, an, it's something that we can kind of just either manage um, on our own 
and through our normal operating procedures, or we're not really sure. So we need to investigate this a little bit more. And so here the assessment team is trying to look at the potential scope of that incident. And so just kind of doing a standby and investigating further, maybe you bring more, more people in to help you with that assessment. If it does meet, then you activate that functional team where they assess the incident and, and they make sure that, they, that it's meeting the criteria for your plan activation. If you're on standby, you need to continue to monitor to see if, that, if it changes and do we need to start responding. If the functional team says, yes, it meets all of our criteria, then you need to activate whatever functional team or teams is part of that and whatever plans are part of that. If, um, if it's a no, then you go back to that monitoring and, and escalating. And this is where most um, escalation protocols end. But what I want you to do here is think, think that we need to have one more step, which is there needs to be an incident, a unified incident response structure, where no matter what the incident is, if we've decided to activate, that someone within that structure is notified. So we were adding incident reporting right at the beginning here to continue to inform about what might be happening in one part of the organization that could escalate to impact another part of the organization. This is just kind of another picture of what that might look like. So whether it's a life safety issue, you know, information security, all the ones that we just mentioned, to understand that each function has its own escalation and reporting triggers. And that would those would be used to determine then when do we report to that kind of incident, that unified incident commander, that unified um, team that you have in place. Understanding that there should be a designated points of contact in place for reporting incidents of all kinds, and that you should structure your incident response capability so that all incidents are reported directly to that designated individual or team. And when I say individual, we're talking about you know job title, not, not necessarily a person, but whoever has that job title. And then once you've under really confirmed the extent of the incident, understanding which relevant team should be activated. But the main thing is that to ensure that each function is aware that an incident has taken place. So even if it has no impact to your part of the organization and what you're responsible for, just to understand that there is something happening and that you're aware of it and that you could be prepared to respond if that incident escalates. We do know that most organizations have multiple methods for reporting an incident and they use different reporting methods that might be preferable as you know it might depend on who's reporting it so who you know the skills of the person reporting the activity or the incident the urgency of that incident and the sensitivity of the incident but at very much a minimum, there should be a common phone number that should be established to report all types of incidents. So just looking at trying to remove those silos as much as we can. For this presentation, we're using um, the Unified, Unified Incident Command structure as our example, but understanding that you can use any um, command structure that you already have in place. And, and also looking at the fact that each functional team should have a similar structure. So the incident commander, who's ever in charge, whether it's your crisis management team leader, whatever you call that person, um, that team lead should be part of that, of that functional team, should be part of that unified incident command structure. So if you use something like a steering committee or you know, a crisis management team that you have representatives throughout the organization, this would work in the same way. Because any structure is going to work, as long as you have a common structure and a common way to report an incident that impacts one or more of your functions. So we look at things like chain of command, which is that orderly line of authority. So how does this move up and down? And then we look at unity of command, which means that every individual has a designated supervisor who you report to um, during an incident. So you have an understanding of both of those pieces of the command structure. The other piece that having a unified command structure is really helpful with is under resource management, because it really leads to more efficient use and allocation of resources. And we're not gonna be really fighting over resources and being concerned 
with um, trying to get the right resources that somebody else might have in place. So by having that unified command structure, you have a way to allocate resources and you have a, a really much broader way of looking at how you might categorize or order or dispatch or track or recover resources that you might have. And so in order to ensure readiness, there should be in place prior to an incident, of course, a standardized and comprehensive database of your resources, as well as what are the protocols to access them and utilize them. And then again, as you're recovering to demobilize some of those resources as well. So let's take our next poll and look at, I would like to get your feedback to what extent does your organization have an incident response capability that um, is implemented across your organization. And I've just given considerations here, you know, life safety, the ones that we've just talked about as our examples. So give me a second to get that launched and we'll give you about 30 seconds. So you have choices of, we are very integrated across all functions. Um, some functions are integrated, others not so much, or each of our functions operates on its own. Give you about 10 more seconds. All right. So this actually is pretty interesting. It aligns up very closely with the role that you have in incident response. Although the 13% um, is a little higher than the 8% that we saw as far as being involved. So 13% of you said that each of our functions operates on its own, and 26 of you, which is about double of that, says you're very integrated. This is actually really exciting to see that 26% of you are very integrated. This means we've made some movement. I asked the same question about five years ago, and um, we had about 70% of the, of the people say that each of the functions were operating on its own, with about 20% um, having some were integrated and then the remainder were very integrated. So this is really great news. I, I feel like we're making some progress. So that's, congratulate yourselves. So I wanna share, share with you next some of the different incident management life cycles that are out there to be used. This one is um, from the NIST and it's from the 861 series. And this has to do with incident management as it's related to um, information and cybersecurity. So you have your preparation phase, your detected detection and analysis phase, then you move on to containment and eradication. I think they just wanna use really big words on this that are harder to say, um, and recovery. And then look at your post-incident activity and, and moving back to doing your improvements and moving back to preparation. We also have in 27,000 an incident management life cycle where you plan and prepare, you detect and report, you assess and make decisions, you respond, and then you do your lessons learned. In this case, one of the things that's different between this one and the NIST one is that the ISO standard stresses the importance of incident communication with that report piece. And that sharing of incident information is sometimes really, really critical for incident containment. And so emphasizing reporting at the very beginning at, while you're detecting it also helps to increase awareness of what's going on. And so this is the piece that I, will, I want you to focus on is this idea that we need to be reporting as early as we can to get that cross-functional awareness going on as well. ITIL has one as well where they talk about logging, assignment, tracking, categorization, prioritization, and then closing an incident. And then um, I wanted to address, we're gonna use the NIST example here to address the incident response scenarios. So this is where you can really use this as a tool to start integrating across functions by using a common process for identifying what your planning is. And it's not necessarily what you're planning for, it's the questions that you're asking. And these questions aren't all inclusive, they're really to get you thinking. So on the preparation side, the question becomes, would the organization consider this event to be an incident? And then looking at what measures do we have in place to attempt to prevent this type of incident from occurring or to limit its impact. So even just looking at different scenarios and um, 
And so looking at these scenarios become important from the, from the planning and preparation piece. And so if you use these same questions, they can really help you with that planning. The second piece is on the detection and analysis side. So the question is, you know, what precursors of the incident, if any, might the organization detect? So when we're looking at things like horizon scanning or trying to predict what might be happening, identifying what those precursors might look like become really important. And then which indicators would cause someone to think that an incident might have occurred? So what are your triggers for reacting and, and to doing something about what you've seen? Um, what additional tools might you need to detect this particular type of incident? So as you're planning for these things, looking at what kinds of resources might you need? And then looking at your incident response team, how do they analyze and validate the event? What processes are they using? What personnel do we need involved in that analysis and validation process? And then number five, to which people or groups within the organization would the team report the incident? And how would the team prioritize the handling of the incident? So how we're getting kind of that categorization and prioritization aspect of this. And then moving to kind of that containment, eradication, and recovery piece. So what strategy should the organization take to contain the incident? Um, why is this strategy preferable to others? So as you're going through these different scenarios, um, what kinds of strategies do we have in place already? What might we need to have? Um, and what could happen if we don't contain it? So if we're not able to manage with the current strategies that we have in place. And then consider, we've already talked about what tools might you need to detect an incident, what additional tools might you need to respond to the incident? So what strategies and solutions do we currently have in place? And as we're considering different scenarios, are we missing any tools or any strategies and solutions that we might need to add? Who needs to be involved? So we talked about who needs to be involved to analyze and validate the incident. Who do we need to add into this team now when you're moving to the containment and the recovery side? And then back to the sources of evidence. So what do we need to acquire as part of the recovery from this incident? How are we going to identify what it is we need? Um, where should we store this information and how long should it be retained? So as we're looking at the decisions that were made, during this, during this process, um, what were the evidence of how the things, how everything worked and what didn't work and how can we leverage that, how can we store it and how can we use it? Which brings us to that post-incident activity, which is we should always be having these lessons learned and what, what could we do to prevent similar incidents from occurring, which brings us back to that preparation phase again. All right, this happened to us. We don't want it to go through this again. How can we improve? and um, increase our preparedness? And, and how, what could be done to improve our detection? So obviously, if it happened to us, um, maybe we didn't detect it early enough. Maybe there wasn't any choice. Maybe we detected it, but it was large enough that we didn't have plans or procedures in place to do that. But looking at that improvement piece is a huge piece of this. So just understand that this process, while it was developed you know, as part of the NIST for, for information and cybersecurity, this applies to any sort of incident across any function. What we're trying to do is come up with a common process that everyone can use so that we're really, well, I'll use the phrase, speaking the same language. So there's also some general questions that you might want to consider. You know, how many incident response team members would participate in handling this type of incident as you look at your different scenarios? Besides the incident response team, which groups in the organization should be involved in handling it? So are there other parts of the organization that we need to bring in? We're now looking outside of your organization and looking at the reporting. So some of, for some sorts of incidents, there are legal and regulatory requirements for reporting. So who do we need to report to? What needs, what's the timing of that? So when do you need to make that report? Um, how could the report be made and what information do you need to report and what kinds of information should we not report externally and why? So what's the thinking around that? Looking at other communications with external parties that you should have in place. What tools and resources do you need? And what aspects um, might have been different if the incident had occurred at a different day and time or 
or maybe on, you know, if it's during on hours versus off hours. So start looking at your scenario and think about um, how it might change versus the schedule, the timing of it. And also looking at the physical location. So if it had occurred um, at, at a manufacturing location that you have, or maybe if it's occurring at your offices where the administration works, or if it's an offsite type of thing. So just looking at these scenarios from all different types of viewpoints and using that common process to do that. And what I wanted to just kind of throw out there, for those of you that are older, at one point, we had things called contingency plans. And this is very common in the emergency management sector, which is you have a, a plan for each type of incident and they were called contingency plans. It's often seen around natural disasters and they make a lot of sense around natural disasters. So how you plan for responding to a hurricane or a flooding situation is gonna be different than how you respond to a fire or um, you know, a tornado or any something like that. But understanding that what we wanna be doing is taking our different plans and procedures that we have in place and put together a common planning process with a similar structure so that all of our plans to manage risk can be integrated into that single and unified incident response structure. And so when you explore different scenarios, this really helps to demonstrate how incidents can impact those different functions and helps you to identify triggers for that collaboration process. I always use this picture because I, maybe it's because something that I saw when I was a kid, but determining the correct response is really important. And so when they went out to find this, you know, Jaws, the movie Jaws, in case you've not seen it, you should. But you know, Chief Brody said, we need to get a team together to investigate um, the sighting of this huge shark. And so when they, he got together his crew and his first observation when they saw the shark, notice they've got these little ropes in their hands without even gloves on. And his observation is, ah, we are going to need a bigger boat. So what he was really doing was more than an observation. He was making a strategic assessment of both the practical tools that he had on hand, which didn't look like it much, and what he thought he was gonna to need to catch that great shark. And he was also inquiring about the resolve, resolve of his shark hunting team. So the team of people that were um, supposed to be part of that response itself. So normally you have some sort of an incident response timeline. So having this common timeline would also be really important and to understand how that timeline might look different depending on your function and the role in the business. And some of those might need to be much faster or some of those can be more drawn out, but for everybody to understand the timelines between the different functions is important. So you have to detect and report the incident details. You then match your incident against your known scenarios you have to escalate the incident response to whatever teams that need to be involved. And then you need to prioritize that incident response in terms of the impact and the urgency, and of course, resolve it as quickly as possible. Kind of going back to some common incident response actions. So when you're looking at detection and analysis, you know, just the very first thing is, is this an incident? looking and analyzing those indicators and having those indicators be something that people can visualize across functions is also really important. So you need to document and gather your evidence. You need to prioritize how you're going to manage that incident, again, against that potential impact and, and also your recoverability. So how, you know, is this something we've planned for? And make sure you're reporting that to the appropriate personnel. Notice that we're seeing some repetition here, which I'm trying to do as well, just to get you thinking in the right direction. So you need to continue acquiring and documenting information about the incident, making sure you're containing and mitigating it by following established procedures, escalate when you need to other functional areas, and, and really try to recover from that incident once, once you've addressed all the issues. And like we said, create a report summarizing the incident and the actions you've taken and making sure that you've got that lessons learned meeting and that you're, you're putting that forward to, to support um, the planning for the next one. These are also some others that, that are maybe a little less formal, but they're, they are more kind of using the language of business continuity and risk management. So assessing the nature and extent of the incident and its potential impact, um, activating your appropriate response, establishing your, for your priorities, going back to that life safety, if it's a life safety issue, um, 
figuring out do we have to um, identify what are our incident management objectives? So what do we have currently planned and how do we implement those? Who's gonna be in charge and responsible for leading this? Um, what are the actual actions that need to be taken? So this kind of goes to that incident management objective. So here we've got our plans in place, but we also need to put a plan together for how we're gonna manage this specific incident, utilizing those plans and procedures that we've done ahead of time. People need to have tasks assigned to them and you need to be able to communicate with all those different interested parties. Um, if you have legal and uh, regulatory or contractual obligations to meet, whether they're, if it's a business interruption, meeting your service level agreements, looking at your span of control to make sure that that is working for you as you expand with your, um, you know, if it's an incident that requires the activation of more than one set of functional teams, of course, monitor the impacts of your actions taken. So we did this, did it work? You should be doing that as well for your communications and making sure that, that, that you've got people recording the details of the incident and the actions that you've taken and that the decisions that you've made. This is really important as you have those, kind of all I'll say is your functional area, incident commanders or the person in charge reporting up to that unified structure, being able to record that as quickly and as accurately as possible and, and also as succinctly as possible. So another thing that you need to be doing is collecting incident related information. And so by you know, we need to have a standard set of data that you're collecting for each incident. So this is where, again, it's very easy to collaborate if you're collecting information in a similar manner. This will help facilitate more effective and consistent incident handling or response, but also really assist your organization in meeting your incident reporting requirements, for example. So getting the contact information of the people that are reporting the incident the name, the role, what part of the organization they're with, your, the email, the phone number, the location, any information that you think is relevant. And then looking at what do we need to know about the incident itself? So is it at a physical location? What's the current status? Do you have an idea of the source or the cause? Um, the description of the incident. So how was it detected? What's occurred? Um, how has it affected your resources? And what kind of category would you think that it would be in? And then, you know, when did the incident start? When was it detected? Might Those might be very two different things. And when was it first reported? Those might be ve three very different pieces of your timeframes. And then looking at how do we gonna need to prioritize that as far as impact? We talked about recoverability and what's already been performed. So I can't talk about this in detail because it'll it's too upsetting, but in the United States, we had another school shooting yesterday or the day before, whatever day it was, it was awful. And one of the things that really showed was somebody, a person, I don't know if it was a teacher, an employee in the school, but they came out and met the first responsers and in, in less than a minute gave them everything that they needed to know about where the shooter was, where the children were, where the personnel were, and, and really gave that direction in short, succinct pieces and gave that information out. And it was amazing that somebody was able to do that with, I don't know, how much training does somebody working at a school have to do that kind of work? But this becomes really important and, and something that we need to practice is even just being able to communicate effectively incident details, because not all of us are succinct. And knowing how to report that it becomes something that's a skill set that we should be training our people to have. So as part of that, we need to be able to categorize an incident. And so this is where those triggers and escalation pieces for each functional area becomes very important because categorization really helps those responding to understand what type of incident has occurred. And so if we think about categorization to be like a set of buckets and notice the different colors and their different sizes, and each bucket might hold the types of incidents that might occur within that functional area, and then you could group those incidents um, by subsets, by different characteristics. And so one of the things that you're trying to do when you've identified an incident is, um, what's the highest level of a hierarchy for this type of incident? And where, so where do we need to categorize it? Also looking at having identified impact categories. And I know we do this within our individual functional areas, but if we actually compared how the different functional areas um, identified their impact categories and were able to put together um, a chart 
even a simple chart just to show how they compare with each other. So this is just, these are just examples. They're not mutually exclusive. And the impact is gonna be different depending on the functional area. So we just identified financial, reputational, legal or regulatory, contractual, and general business objectives, which is a very big bucket. And looking at magnitude, so it might be having to do with a financial impact and you might have a percentage there. You might look at brand damage. Um, what is your liability for litigation? What's our cost of missed deadlines? Um, what's our cost of losing our customers? And then looking at different impact levels from having really no impact to having a disastrous impact. So that the impact magnitude and level might also differ due to the level and type of resources required to recover from the incident. And really those resources about how prepared are you? So if you're very prepared, you know, the impact might be much less than if you're not prepared for whatever has happened. Also looking at how you might coordinate the response. So you might have a team to team response and then we'll, we'll talk more about that, but just, you know, when you have team members are usually peers and they don't have any authority over each other, but they're choosing, they need to be able to share information, they need to pool their resources and they need to be able to solve problems common to both teams. Oftentimes the type of information shared here is very tactical and technical, but it could also include things that are in your plans and lessons learned as you're, as you're trying to resolve that incident. And then there's that team to unified command piece that, I, that we're trying to address here, that they need to know what's going on. And so you need to be able, and they need to be able to disseminate timely and useful information back to those teams. And so here is where having that communication to whether it's your crisis management team is your group headpiece or your incident command team, um, you know, they need to know where to focus their resources and their attention and, and also in order to make decisions. So, so there needs to be communication going both directions from that as well, which is really showed in this graphic. With, you see the lot of arrows. The whole idea here is everybody needs to be communicating with everyone. And if your unified incident command is your crisis management team, then you might put your, maybe your public relations team in that, in that red bucket instead of your crisis management team. But the main thing is that once an incident is analyzed and prioritized, the unified incident command people on that team need to notify the appropriate individuals so that everyone who needs to, who needs to be involved will start playing their roles and be activated or at least be aware of that. So going back to that reporting piece. Your policies. So here is another place where you need to show alignment be, between all these functional areas. So your policy should document how you report an incident at a minimum, what must be reported to whom and at what times, and what are the kind of the scheduling for updates for that. We do know that reporting requirements are going to vary depending on what the incident is and what type of organization you are as well. Because information sharing and collaboration is a key element for that coordination. And even the smallest organizations need to be able to share incident information with their peers and their partners in order to deal with incidents effectively. And so this is, my, this is something that you need to practice in your exercises is how to do this information sharing throughout that incident response life cycle and not wait until your incident's been fully resolved before the, sharing the details. You can never over communicate the way. So within, any management system standard, there's clause 7.4, I believe, that talks about communications. And you are required if you're following a management, an ISO management system on just understanding on what it is that you're going to communicate and um, documenting that in your plans. Also, when you should communicate. So there's going to be different thresholds when you need to communicate um, and your organization's context, who you are and what you do is gonna dictate how frequently and to whom that's gonna take place, which pretty much leads us to whom. So every, you need to be communicating with everyone from time to time, but there should also be um, some sort of a level of who needs to be communicated with when. And so who are those interested parties? What are their needs and expectations? What are the circumstances in which that communication should take place? And what are the communication priorities? If you have a board, you would hate to have the board be communicated with last. Just throwing that out there. You also should be looking at the means of communication. So what kinds of tools are you going to use to do that communication? 
and, and obviously social media should be part of it, but it shouldn't be the only piece. And then who's assigned to do those communications? And of course, those people should be trained to do that. And there should be those particular points of contacts in each functional area for who should be doing that communicating. When we're looking at documenting the plans, you know, every plan, sh there should be procedures on how to respond to and manage an incident. And what we're really suggesting here is that your incident response plan should follow the same template, no matter what functional area you're in. They should be very similar. Now the content within that's gonna change under that quote outline. But the fact is that we should be using the same template. You can't integrate if you're not using the same, the, the same process. And so of course they should also be used in preparing everybody who's working on those teams to be competent to do that. They should be available when you need them. So this is where in some organizations, if you're a smaller organization and less complex, you know, your incident, you might have one incident response plan and then it identifies the triggers for when you activate which teams or which functional areas. Um, at a minimum, if you're talking for business continuity, um, you know, you should have an incident response procedures as part of your business continuity plan, whether they're um, separate procedures or not. And we kind of going back to that contingency planning, you know, your incident response plans can be generic or they can be for specific risks. So there are times when you need to have a specific process to follow based on a specific type of incident. And this most often occur occurs with life safety types of incidents or natural disaster types of incidents. And so um, just understanding that, but the idea here is that to have this template that we're all following and moving in the same direction and then address the changes as they're needed. Of course, everyone who's assigned a role should understand what they're supposed to be doing before they need to be doing it. And each of those plans should consider information or triggers on when to escalate to a broader, to other um, functions, as well as to that unified command piece. We don't really care what they're named. So, you know, you could use incident response plan, you could use incident management plan, emergency management or emergency response. It doesn't matter. There's a thousand different names that you can use them. The most important thing is that you all use the same plan name in your organization and that you modify it as needed and that your escalation protocols and your scenarios for when it's necessary to bring other teams into the response should be very clearly documented within that system. When you're looking at response plan content, you're going to see that this outline is very similar to any, any plans that you'd see in the ISO world. So you should have a stated purpose, scope and objectives for that plan and that should be defined should be consistent with the basis of those plans themselves and the concept of operations that you're operating on for that particular plan. Um, what are the conditions that would require activation of that incident response structure and what's the process to activate it? Of course, roles and responsibilities, who's involved in the organization and the staffing of that? What are your protective actions and warning systems that you might already have in place? So here is where we're going to looking at that um, detection side of this how you're going to interface with and support between those different functions, between the unified incident command, if you have other response organizations, how you notify those stakeholders, we talked about that, what are your different points of contact? What are the supporting agreements and plans and procedures that you tie to? What kinds of communication and information flow? And I actually like the word reporting flow better in here, but this is what ISO uses. Um, do you have critical facilities and support resources that you need to address? And then how do you do that categorization of activation and notification? So this, we're back to that categorization piece that becomes very important. And how you do your incident assessment and the classification of the incidents themselves. What are your predetermined activities that you have for each of those incident categories? So based on this incident classification and categorization, what are we supposed to be doing? And then of, of course, making sure that you've documented the decisions and you should have this in your plans, a place to document your decisions and the steps that you've taken in response to an incident. And ma again, making sure that that is a standardized place to make those decisions so that it can be easily shared across your different functions. 
So we have our last poll in place here. So let me go ahead and launch that one. That one is, do you believe that your organization would benefit from that incident response structure? Well, obviously the one, those of you that already have that capability in place think that it's a benefit. But again, looking at, you know, you already have something very similar in place. Um, some are integrated, we should consider more. It's something we may be able to implement or we're still very, very siloed. So I'm kind of, this question is a little bit similar to what we asked before, but really looking at um, where you are in that process. All right, looks like I've gone ahead and closed that. So here actually the data is a little bit different than what you reported before. So I, I wasn't sure if I asked that question too similarly or not, but um, we still at, before we were at 13% for being very siloed. So here, um, what we're seeing is it's gonna, some of you believe it's gonna take a lot of work. Some of you believe that um, you should be able to implement some of this. And then, you know, the other split, it's really interesting that 39%, 39%, and then the 11 and the 11. So, you know, almost 80% of you have already started the integration or, or have something very similar in place, which is really exciting. What I hope that you're taking away from here today is that it shouldn't be that hard to get something in place, at least within your individual pillars, you know, at least start there and figure out how you can be integrated there and then to grow um, from there on. And, and I would think that um, the pandemic has helped us a lot with understanding how important it is to collaborate and to work together in a unified way versus continuing to work in our silos. I didn't see any, <coughs> excuse me, any new questions come forth. Um, feel free to ask a question. I did see one that asked about getting copies of the slides. We really don't give out copies of the slides. We know that you can do screen prints as you go and you will get, you know, you can get the link to the webinar to be able to view again. But a lot of the information that we share in um, these webinars, we do also use for teaching. And so we, we just don't hand them out. How, but we know that it's very easy to take what's there too. So we do acknowledge that. Um, looks like we, I see one question coming up. Oh, that's a thank you. Well, you're welcome. If you do come up with other questions later and you'd like to address more, feel free to reach out to me. I wanted to let you know, um, so the, the question here was, are there any recommendations regarding software? So as a nonprofit, and we don't do any consulting, we just sell education and certification. We really don't recommend um, anything and we would just recommend that you go to, you know, there's a lot of different conferences. They have exhibitors um, that sell this type of thing. The main thing I would say as a recommendation is if you're looking at software, that it, it would be something that you would use across all of your functions, which would be helpful because oftentimes we see different incident software used in different parts of the organization, which is a challenge. And make sure that it ties to your communication systems you know, if you have a notification system and make sure it ties to whatever tools that you're using for um, your people, meaning you're not always having to update contacts so that it's it, it can connect with whatever you're using in your talent management or your HR systems for who's actually employed and, and what their jobs are. So just to conclude, we do have our courses on this, and this is one of our courses that's part of preparedness and managing risk under incident response structure. The, um, our webinar coming up next month is on managing data center risk. If you'd like to go back and look at our webinars from January and February, you'll find those on our YouTube channel. Um, if you're a member of i you'll also find it in our library. And take a second here to scan that QR code. Through the end of April, through the Continuity Insights Conference, we are doing um, kind of a snapshot where you can go in and do a very short um, assessment of your resilience capabilities. Um, if you don't have a phone handy, you can use the URL there or you can grab it as, you know, once the webinar is published as well. And we will be sending out to you um, not just how you 
um, your capabilities look like, but also how you compare um, with other organizations that have participated. And we started this in November. And thank you very much for attending. Please connect with us. Um, we'd love to have you. And it is the top of the hour. And oh, you guys need to go back to work. So thank you for taking your time. And we hope to see you again next month.